Okay, I'm not entirely sure on this, but I'm at least 99% sure my house is haunted now. All right, just because like the last day has been really weird. Like doors have been opening and closing by themselves. Computers have been turning on by themselves. Uh, I was, uh, there was a big picture frame in my hallway that just fell down last night. That picture frame has been up for a whole year, a whole year, never moved. Last night it decided all of a sudden to fall down, all right? So uh, I'm thinking I have sort of a paranormal activity situation here. I've lived here for a whole year, and uh, that's how the ghosts get you. That's the plan. They lull you into a false sense of security, but after that one year, it's like, okay, let the hauntings commence. So I have a strategy. I have a strategy. The strategy is to see if the ghost would like to be on YouTube, all right? Because then it would be me and the ghost making YouTube videos together. Maybe the ghost likes One Piece. I don't know. We'll see what happens. I'll keep you updated as we go. All right, this will be One Piece, chapter 1068 review, titled, A Genius's Dream. All right, and we actually continue on with the cover series with um, the Germa Double Six, although now it's kind of moved from the Germa Double Six, like Ichiji, Niji, Yonji, and Reiju. It's now kind of moved to more of like a, a sort of odd couple-esque comedy starring Judge and Caesar Clown. So whatever, I wanted Caesar's like Marvelous Misadventures of Caesar Clown as the next cover story. This is the closest I think we're going to get, okay? So last time Caesar and Judge met each other and they're kind of like, like arguing and they're like, don't I remember you from something? And just like, what? And then in this one, they're straight up brawling. Like, you know, they bonked each other on the heads. They have like swollen eyes or whatever. And you see, it's, it's half obscured. You don't see the whole thing, but you see a bubble appearing above them as they're both remembering the other person. And this is a flashback to their days in MADS, okay? The mad scientist organization that was headed up by Vegapunk back before he joined the world government. Now, we don't know exactly the time frame for all this. We know that uh, 22 years ago, right after the disaster of Ohara, Vegapunk was already working for the government at that point. Uh, Dragon was leading the Freedom Fighters, okay? The implication from their conversation seems to uh, indicate that Vegapunk had recently joined the government at that point 22 years ago. So let's just say to be safe, let's say 30 years ago, uh, Mads was in full operation, okay? Vegapunk was the lead scientist, Queen and Judge were also working for him, and I guess... Caesar was also there. I was under the impression Caesar was like just always working for the government. And then when Vegapunk joined up, Caesar was like their top scientist. And it's like, okay, Caesar, well, you're no longer the top scientist. Now you are, you and, um, and, uh, Vegapunk are going to work together. And that's where Caesar kind of developed his like inadequacies around Vegapunk. It's like maybe he was the government's top dog. And then Vegapunk just, you know, proved to be well out of the realm of like conceivability when it came to science. And so he completely completely overshadowed him, and so that's where, you know, Caesar got upset, but no, no, the implication here, no, Caesar used to be in Mads, so that's crazy, uh, maybe not even 30 years ago, because here's the thing, 30 years ago, Judge and Queen would have been in their mid-20s, Vegapunk would have been in his mid-30s, and Caesar would have been like 10, Okay, because Caesar's like 40 years old right now. But I threw this out in the last uh, review. What if Caesar wasn't really a scientist back then? He was more of just like the dorky lab assistant for everybody. You know, he was the one that carried around the, the trays and the beakers and like, okay, sir, here's your coffee, sir. I'm sorry, sir. He was the intern, okay? He was the intern working in MADS. Um, but, you know, no matter what, like even if you want to say... You know, even if you want to say this was like 25 years ago, you know, then yeah, yeah, he would have definitely, he wouldn't have been some kind of brilliant scientist. He definitely would have been a dorky lab assistant at best, okay? But Judge was there, Queen was there, and Caesar's there. You also see Vegapunk wearing the striped shirt, the one that we saw in the flashback with Kuma. Although, okay, the striped sweater is canon. However, in that flashback, Vegapunk was a lot taller than he actually is, so I'm still calling retcon, but I, I give you points points Oda for including the striped sweater, all right? That's that's one thing in One Piece I'm glad is is solved. The One Piece, turns out, is just a collection of Vegapunk striped sweaters. 
I'd be okay with it. All right, so anyway, we cut uh, back to uh, Egghead Island, where we continue on from the last chapter. We uh, start off with Pythagoras. Okay, so the last time this happened, um, the Cypher Pull Zero ship was approaching the island. The mechanical sea beast came out. I think Luchi or Kaku, they sunk like one or two of them. And then they were like, you know, we need permission to dock to return this S-Bear. S-Bear is the Seraphim name of Kuma. So Kuma's Seraphim that's with them that they said was a little defective, okay? Okay. So uh, they called to request to dock, and now uh, you had Shaka that was denying the request, and now you have Pythagoras who's sort of dealing with them directly. Remember, Pythagoras is the robot satellite of Vegapunk who handles wisdom, okay? And he seems to be a very easygoing, soft-spoken kind of satellite, okay? It's probably good that they chose him for this, because uh, we're going to see how Lilith would have responded in a second. But Pythagoras basically walks out, and he's on like a Den Den Mushy kind of like intercom system, uh, you know, relaying the information to the cipher poll, and he's like, hey, yeah, uh, cipher poll, we, we really appreciate you coming all this way to return S. Bear to us, but, um, it's okay, you don't need to dock here, just, you know, command S. Bear to head to the island on its own, it should be able to travel using its own power, it doesn't, you don't need to dock here, uh, you, you can just leave, it's fine, we're, wow, which is, we're really busy today, you know what I mean, we have the, we have the test tubes and the science, batteries and the, the 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 geometry geography geology machine over here it it measures geography and it also weighs geology and it's just it's all this crazy stuff over here so the lorax just just got here right so this is turning into a dr seuss book um the 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 splendidly demplers and the uh the the who's a what's it's you know they've just been going crazy lately we can't we can't see you sorry so um then the, the cypher pole actually are playing along with with this in a much more polite way than I originally assumed they would. You know, this is like Luchi and Kaku and Stussy and a bunch of other government workers. You know, I was thinking they were just basically like, like honestly speaking, this is some good like role playing here. If the if the Cypher Pull Zero were like you know PCs in a D and D campaign, this is pretty good because it's like okay, you arrive at the island, they're not letting you in. It'd be like I cast Eldritch Blast on the door. You know, like that's how I thought this was gonna go. But no, Kaku is just. Just like, hey, wait a second, come on, guys. We just had this really long journey. You can't invite us in for some tea or some coffee or just let us rest up for a little while. And uh, Lucci immediately knows something's up. Lucci is there. They're all wearing their masks. And Lucci's just thinking to himself of just like, all right, something's up here. He's suspicious of something. He knows we're trying to kill him, you know. But I'm sure that just maybe excites Lucci even more because it's like the most dangerous game kind of a situation. Like, hmm, my query is beginning to move. I must attack, you know. So Lucci knows something's up. Kaku seems to be pleading ignorance here. I don't know if it's an act or if he genuinely just wants a cup of tea. It's like, come on, man, we've been into the ocean for like two weeks. We just want some tea. And so um, Pythagoras comes on. He's like, well, you know, G14 isn't that far from here, the marine base that Dahl is the head of, you know, Vice Admiral Dahl, you could head over there. I'm sure they would accommodate you with some uh, delicious continental breakfast and tea and coffee and everything that you could possibly want. You should head over to G14. We're too busy today. Uh. Okay. So now Lucci speaks up. Lucci takes the Denden Mushy and he begins to communicate and he's like, this is Dr. Vegapunk, right? And it's Pythagoras still, but yes. And so Pythagoras is like, yes. He's like, all right. Have you been aware of the sheer number of disappearances of government ships that have been occurring around Egghead Island? Like how no government ship in the last two months has returned safely from Egghead Island. And he goes on, he says, um, two months ago, there was a CP-5 vessel that went missing around here. Then, one month ago, there was a CP-7 vessel that went missing. And then just two weeks ago, CP-8. So something's been going on here. A single government ship hasn't came back from Egghead in two months. And Pythagoras is just like, he's denying it. He's just like, oh, well, you know, gee shucks, I, I don't know what uh, to make of that. I mean, I, I remember them all visiting us, and we were accommodating, and we were really nice, and uh, then they left, and they departed safely. I don't remember a single, single negative thing from that whole encounter, so I don't know. Maybe they just got lost, <laughs> you know? So the, uh, the order that he listed off those cipher pole organizations, so it was CP5, and then CP7, and then CP8. All right, so um, it was revealed in an SBS a little while ago that the cipher poles are numbered 
numbered based off of the tasks they are given and entrusted with, okay? Meaning that CP1 is given like the most low quality, like not a big deal set of low, low urgency level, uh, you know, situations. So CP1 is probably not going out like on assassination jobs. They're probably dealing with more of like general intel. You know what I mean? Like in the One Piece where the whole point of the Cypherpole organization is to basically be the clandestine um, spy network to make sure everybody is playing along in the One Piece world, like with the world government, to make sure there's not going to be any uprisings, there's not going to be anybody trying to like invade Marijua or attack the world nobles, there's no threats against that kind of stuff. Um, so I would imagine, like let's say you're in a kingdom, right, and you're in a bar one night, and you over here in this bar, like some people are going to try to overthrow the king or something like that. That might be something CP1 might be called for, of like, hey, we, we heard a rumor on this one island, they might try to you know, like overthrow their king, and so maybe some members of CP1 might show up just to confirm or deny these rumors. Very low stakes kind of situation, okay? But um, as the urgency increases, as the importance of the mission goes up, then more and more higher rank Cypherpool, okay? So they sent Cypherpool 5, and then it got upgraded to Cypherpool 7, and then it got Cypher Cypherpool 8, okay? Now, in terms of the citizens of the One Piece world, the only ones they're aware of is CP1 through CP8. 8 is like the highest cypher pool. Now, we know that is not the case. CP9 was the super secret branch that nobody really knew about other than like the government. Only like a few people knew about that. And then cypher pool 0, I... I hesitate to say, I, I think Cypher Pool Zero is known to the public uh, because they're the ones that directly guard the Tenry Beto. So I'm thinking Cypher Pool Zero is like public knowledge, but CP9 isn't. So they didn't mention CP9 here, and I think that's because right now CP9 probably doesn't exist. Uh, I'm pretty sure most of the CP9 operatives that we knew about during Eddie's Lobby, like Kaku, Jabra, well, definitely Kaku, but like Jabra, Kumadori, uh, if you saw film Red, Khalifa was confirmed to be a member of Cypher Pool Zero in film red so they've all been upgraded to cp0 at this point maybe cypherpool 9 still exists in some form but there's not as many members and it's not as strong okay so basically you could see what the government was doing there it's like okay we're gonna send cp5 all right they didn't come back all right send cp7 we're upping the urgency all right they didn't come back all right send cp8 all right they're not coming back all right we're not playing around send cp0 all right this is what we're doing here okay so Pythagoras just denies everything. Uh, at this point, Lilith takes over. Lilith grabs the Den Den Mushi from Pythagoras, kind of pushes him aside, and he's just like, hey, what are you doing? Are you claiming that we're the ones that sunk all those marine ships? Are you claiming that the marine ships came to Egghead and we sunk them all with our advanced technology? I have half a mind to let you dock just to prove that we didn't do that. So Lilith and then the Pythagoras is in the background like, please don't. That's literally the exact opposite of what we want right now. <laughs> you know, so that's a, like a handle on the different personalities and stuff. So Lilith does not take these claims lightly. Um, and so she's like, hey, regardless, you know, we, we can't let you in. We're, you're not allowed to dock today. All right. Send the S bear back to the lab and just be on your merry way. All right. And to this... Lucci actually agrees. He's like, very well, understood, click. Let me tell you, everybody, if I was on the other end of that Den Den Mushi, that very well, understood, click, that would send shivers down my spine because it'd be like, oh, he's not just going to leave, is he? And it's like, probably not. It's Rob Lucci. I'm like, oh, okay. So um, they're not stupid either. They're not like, whoa, wow. That was a close one. <laughs> that was a close one, everybody. Well, we're good. Everybody's cool. No, they're kind of like, yeah, they're still probably going to attack us, okay? So they bring up uh, Lucci's like, okay, prepare to abandon ship, all right? Because here's the problem. They have this big government ship they're on right now, but they're surrounded by these mechanized sea beasts. Now, the cypher pole are really strong, but the ship really isn't. So they're like, okay, if we try to just go forward in the ship, the sea beast would just tear this thing to shreds. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to abandon the ship. We're going to use S-Bear's ability to warp to the island, and then while the ship is being destroyed and they think that we're, like, we're dead, then we're going to invade the island, okay? So this confirms, and we see it later on, that uh, S-Bear does in fact have the pawpaw fruit, the same devil fruit that Kuma had, all right? 
this 100% confirms that Vegapunk is in fact able to create artificial copies of Paramecia Devil Fruits, okay? Because last time when we saw S-Shark, when we saw Seraphim Jinbe using the Swim Swim Fruit, um, I, I immediately jumped to the conclusion that he could make artificial Paramecias, but a lot of other people were under the impression of like, well, what if he killed Senor Pink, took his fruit, and gave it to Seraphim Jinbe? And that makes sense. It's just the, it's just more of the boring explanation rather than the exciting explanation, you know what I mean? So I went with the exciting explanation because, yeah, yeah, Senor Pink would have been captured. He would have been an impel down, I guess, after the whole events at Dressrosa. So uh, I guess it would have been possible for Vegapunk to, like, have him killed, take the Swim Swim Fruit, give it to Jinbei Seraphim, okay? But in this case, it's very clear because we see PX0 also in this chapter. We see real Kuma back at uh, the Kamabaka Kingdom, and he still has the pawpaw fruit. So he has the pawpaw fruit, and the seraphim has the pawpaw fruit. So that's very clearly like, you know, he can copy devil fruits, and so that's a paramecia. So this is, I guess it would be the swim swim fruit is the first example of an artificial paramecia we've seen in the story, and the pawpaw fruit is the second example, okay? So uh, I just wanted to clear that up there, but yes, both Esper and Kuma still have the same fruit, with Kuma having the original, so clearly there's some scientific uh, shenanigans afoot here, okay? So they understand, there's like, okay. They also have a bunch of like government soldiers with them, like just a bunch of random black suit wearing government soldiers, like the men in black, they have rifles. They're probably all going to die immediately, so don't worry too much about them. Uh, we now cut back to the Kamabaka Kingdom where Kuma is still running away and the Revolutionary Army is trying to stop him, but before they can really do anything, Kuma activates his own pawpaw paw fruit and then and then he just, you know, teleports, he warps, okay? And then, you know, Dragon and Ivankov and Inazuma and everybody could not stop him, so he just vanishes. And they're like, Kuma, where did you go? Where did you go, Kuma? And so, that's it. That's literally the entire scene on Kamabaka, okay? Now, a couple of things to keep in mind with Kuma's Devil Fruit ability, okay? It is not straight-up teleportation, all right? It is not the same thing like Van Auger's Warp Warp Fruit where you can just instantaneously teleport between two different locations, okay? What Kuma's ability does, it allows him to send things flying at an extremely fast speed in a straight line. Pretty much it doesn't matter what it comes in contact with, whether it be a mountain or anything, it just breaks right through it, and it will send a person to a different location, okay? Now, he did this with the Straw Hats, and it takes about three days and three nights for this to occur, okay? For the Straw Hats to reach their intended destination, or rather, it was mentioned that I think three days, three nights is the upper limit. Like, maybe Kuma can send somebody to the other side of the planet in three days and three nights. That's pretty good travel time from the One Piece world perspective, okay? Where, like, airplanes don't exist. So, I don't think this means... I mean, unless it got awakened, it could have always gotten awakened and gotten even stronger. It's very possible. Um, but it's not a straight-up teleportation that we've seen in the story so far. So, I don't think it's going to be like Kuma's at Kamabaka, and he's like, wait a second... Blip. And then we just immediately cut over to Egghead where Luffy is running around and then blip, he just pops into existence there. Unless this scene at Kamabaka takes place a few days prior, which could work. Um, you know, uh, maybe Kuma began to activate, you know, two days ago at Kamabaka and then he did this and then he got sent flying. Oda didn't say that one way or the other, but I'm just saying it's, it's not instantaneous teleportation. It's not like Kuma does that and he instantly warps to the other side of the planet. That's not how it's been shown to work, okay? Although, hmm, although I will say, he is the user of the Devil Fruit rather than using the ability on somebody else. Whenever he uses the ability on somebody else, it takes days and days to travel. Since he's the actual owner of the fruit, Maybe the rules don't apply to him. Maybe that three-day rule doesn't apply to him. Maybe he can just, maybe he can actually teleport, but only himself. I don't know. I guess we'll see where this goes. I guess it depends on how long the Straw Hats can hold out on Egghead, okay? They hold out that, you know, CP0 opens up a siege around Egghead. It lasts for three days, and then Kuma finally arrives. You know, maybe. I don't know. Okay, so now we cut over to the Junk Heap, uh, where we have Vegapunk and we have Luffy's group. Okay, now Vegapunk is going on in detail, explaining why he wants to go off of Egghead Island, alright? And uh, Jinbei even brings up, he's just like, you know, oh, if you leave, then won't that cause a lot of problems? You know, if you just leave this place, you know, the government's gonna be in an uproar. And Vegapunk is just like, well, see, here's the situation, Quasar. You see, the government's been giving me, I, I, I am grateful, I am grateful, Quasar. I mean, they've given me resources, and I've 
spent every berry they've given me, my, my yearly allotment or whatever on all my inventions, but it's just not enough. It's just not enough. What I want, what my dream is to do, is to make a world where free energy is available to all. Quasar! I'm gonna end the energy crisis if my name isn't Dr. Richard Vega Punk. <laughs> Wait a second, your name is Richard? He's like, yeah. Hi, my name's Richard. Nice to meet you. Oh, that's cool. It's kind of like Rick Sanchez from Rick and Morty. Oh, gee shucks. That was the inspiration the whole time. It's a good thing Tekking used all of those images of Rick from Rick and Morty in the thumbnails. It all came back canon. Quasar. His name's not actually Richard. I'm just messing with you. But no, uh, would that be funny, though? That would be great. That would be fantastic. Okay, but anyway, all right. So Vegapunk's dream, we, we thought in the last chapter it was to create the internet, but no, even better than the internet, he wants to create free energy for everybody in the world to use. Um, now Luffy's reaction to this, when you, when you start getting into like, you're now getting into a topic that in our world is hotly debated, you know, like the energy crisis, what do we do? You know for a fact Luffy cares not for any of this. Luffy just immediately after he said, you know, because he, he was excited at first. Like, what's your dream, old man? What do you want? He's like, I will create free energy for the entire world. And Luffy's just like, what's that? <laughs> what's that? Uh, free, uh, I don't get it, but apparently you want to give people free stuff. Good for you. So in order to try to get Luffy to understand this a little bit better, uh, Jinbei begins to explain to him, he's like, well, Luffy, um, you see, certain nations in the world will often wage wars with other nations because of a lack of natural resources to be used as energy. Okay, and Luffy still kinda doesn't get it, but Vegapunk is like, ah yes, precisely, precisely, people can be so short-sighted. There's energy all around us, swirling about in the world. And they look up and they actually see like swirling patterns around them. And I'm not really sure what this is supposed to indicate, whether this is like some kind of like, maybe just like Vegapunk seeing it like this, or if this is actually happening, or if Vegapunk's using some kind of like illusion or something for like swirling energy to just appear over their heads. Maybe it has something to do with the island clouds. I don't know. But he's basically talking about how there's so much raw energy in the earth, in the world, that we just haven't accessed yet. We haven't tapped yet, okay? Well, I hope to solve the energy crisis, create an unlimited source of energy that everyone can access, and then there will never be conflict ever again. Okay, to that, I have to say, good idea, Vegapunk. I mean, that's very noble of you to make, the, you know, the infinite energy. That's a good idea. Saying that's going to just stop all wars and conflict, that's a little bit of your scientist naivete speaking, okay? Because pretty sure that wouldn't happen, all right? Pretty sure there would still be war, all right? And in fact, you know what? I have the perfect way of, of explaining how it would. Um, all right, so let's say there's this one kingdom over here, right? And then there's another kingdom over here. Let's say Kingdom A and Kingdom B. Now let's say right now, uh, Kingdom A is in a little bit of an energy crisis, okay? They don't really have enough natural resources to supply all of their stuff, okay? But Kingdom B does. So Kingdom A is now involved in a war to fight against Kingdom B to get their resources. Okay, that's what's going on right now. Uh, and they don't really like each other either. So let's say then Vegapunk invents like this perpetual motion machine or whatever. He invents this unlimited energy source. So now Kingdom A has unlimited energy and Kingdom B has unlimited energy. So Vegapunk's like, there you go. Now you don't need to fight anymore. Yeah. And then one day Kingdom A, the king wakes up and he's just like, ah, man, that Kingdom B guy is a real asshole. You know what? Attack him just because. Because that's how people are sometimes. That's how, like, megalomaniacal rulers can be, you know? It's just like, you know what? Especially in One Piece, where it's dialed up so they're even more a little bit exaggerated. Did you see some of the people at the Reverie? You know what I mean? Some people at the Reverie, it seemed like they just, like, you know what? That guy over there on the other side of the table looked at me funny. That other guy was a little sarcastic to me at the Reverie. They'll have what's coming to them, you know? That's really when it comes down to conflict, okay? The energy thing would definitely help, but it wouldn't, like, bring world peace. But I think that's what Vegapunk wants there to be, okay? So, uh, yeah. But it's a noble cause. It's a noble cause, all right? You at least gotta try, right? You gotta at least try, okay? Luffy is still just like... Hmm. 
And it's just like, you still don't care? It's like, not really. <laughs> you know, it's like, I, I don't really get it, but you do want to make people happy, and that's a good thing. I'm not interested in being a hero at all, uh, even though, okay, Luffy... Luffy's been a hero in this story many times. In fact, you know what? That's the second time he's brought this up. He brought it up at Fishman Island, too, uh, where Luffy is like, I, I want to be a pirate. I don't want to be a hero. It's like, well, too bad. You're already a hero in many, many, many cultures and islands, okay? I might just make a video all about that, like Luffy's hero complex. But anyway, uh, he says, I'll tell you what, tell you what. You're a nice guy. I also like the fact you have an apple for a head. So, uh, sure, I'll let you travel with me. So, that's like, Vegapunk was trying too hard with this. Vegapunk was like, I need to convince Straw Hat Luffy, one of the emperors, to take me on his ship away from Egghead. I know. I'll explain my deep-seated goal to bring free energy to the world and solve the crisis and help everybody out as far as the eye could see. Then that will convince him. Now, Vegapunk, you're thinking way too much about this. All you really needed to do was say, hey, Luffy, I have an apple for a head. Can I travel with you? Oh, sure, old man. <laughs> like, really? That's all you needed. That's all you needed to say. All right, but here we are. Okay, Luffy agrees. That's all good. Vegapunk goes on to say, though, he's like, well, it was my understanding of energy. I wanted to research energy. I wanted to learn about new aspects of energy. Lilith mentioned this earlier to the Straw Hats is when I discovered the energy source for the Iron Giant. So he doesn't understand the energy source of the Iron Giant, but he knows the Iron Giant came from the Void Century. So, you know, using his reasoning, he's like, okay, that means the Void Century does have access to this infinite energy. So he started researching the Void Century, and that's a big no-no. So that's what led him to have a problem right now with the government and why they're sending Cypher Pool Zero to eliminate him, okay? He also brings up Clover. He says, you know, after a dear friend of mine died, I found myself diving even deeper into history, you know, to further his own will. Okay, so Clover died, and even though Vegapunk knew researching the, uh, the Void Century was a huge taboo and the government will eliminate you no matter who you are, he still did it, for one thing, to further Clover's own will, and Clover was a friend of his, and number two, because it is where the secret of this energy source lies, okay? So then he began to research, and he goes on, but as soon as he begins to talk, there are explosions now in the town. So they're in the junkyard right now. They start seeing explosions happening from the town behind them, so that kind of cuts the conversation short. Um, Vegapunk just basically just like sums it up and he's just like, ah, right, okay, so there are explosions happening. I see they're already here. Okay, so to sum this up, uh, TLDR, uh, I'm researching energy. The government doesn't want me to, so they're going to eliminate me. This is probably Cypher Pole Zero, uh, and uh, they're going to eliminate me like O'Hara. So you get it? Okay. Anyway, I need you to take Bonnie and go up to the Labo Sphere. It's the giant cloud thing, the egg. Can you make it up there? And Luffy's like, uh, yeah, sure, we can take her. Okay, that's great. I'll see you up there in a couple of minutes. Later, try not to die, Quasar, and he just phases out of existence because he's mastered the power of space-time, all right? And he can, he can straight-up teleport. Vegapunk, with his technology, pretty much can straight-up teleport, okay? So that's, that's pretty impressive, okay. Well, anyway, now we cut back to Cypher Pole Zero. They have arrived at the island, so they're uh, at the same area where uh, all the researchers are, okay? So just the regular scientists are just walking around, and they see Cypher Pole Zero, and they've never seen... Well, okay, this makes me think maybe they don't know about Cypher Pole Zero, um, because they say, oh, they, they're not wearing the black suits that Cypher Pole usually wears, so they're not used to seeing Cypher Pole Zero, so maybe they've heard about them, but just in rumors or whatever. Maybe they're more of a shadowy organization than I think of. Anyway, they're beginning to freak out because they're just kind of like showing up and taking the place over. Kaku is extremely impressed. Kaku is just like, wow, this place is real, wow, gee golly, this is just a massive uh, ma uh, futuristic wonderland. Um, keep in mind, Kaku Kaku also speaks like an old man. Uh, he's 25 right now, but he speaks like he's 75, all right? He's just like, he's just like, well, golly gee willikers, you know, like he kind of talks like that, which makes Kaku a very fun kind of character. I'm glad Kaku is back. Are you glad Kaku is back? He's got two years to train with his giraffe fruit. I'm sure it'll look pretty cool. Um, so anyway, uh, oh yeah, Jinbei explains the Cypher Pole Zero to Luffy. This is great. Luffy's never actually encountered Cypher Pole Zero in the canon of the manga. So he just doesn't know. So they're like, oh, um, Cypher Pole Zero is attacking. And Luffy's like, Cypher Pole Zero? Don't you mean Cypher Pole 9? And then Jinbei's like, no, Luffy. Cypher Pole Zero are the strongest of the strongest. They're the, the ones directly serving the Tenrubito. And Luffy's like, oh. 
Huh. And Jinbei goes on to say that when they show up, each member literally has the potential to cause a catastrophe on their own. All right. So, uh, yeah, that's just funny to me that Luffy's never really, he's never encountered them directly anyway. Uh, I think he's seen members of Cypher Pool Zero before, but he's never actually had like a direct confrontation with somebody in Cypher Pool Zero. He fought Luchi, but that was back when he was a member of Cypher Pool 9. So, yeah, he just doesn't know. That's an interesting little thing there. So we cut that back to the lab now. We see Shaka, Pythagoras, uh, the Straw Hats are still there. They're magnetized to the floor, so they can't, they can't move still. And so they're examining what happened. So the ship outside of the island, the uh, government ship, got completely destroyed by the sea beasts. However, they utilized Esper's teleportation ability to send them to the island. Now, in this case, it did work like teleportation because the distance wasn't that far. It's like the shore of Egghead and then Egghead itself. So probably only took like, you know, five seconds to warp them to the shore. But the distance that Kuma is attempting to travel from Kamabaka, that's back in paradise. This is the new world. That is literally like on the other side of the planet almost, okay? So that's the thing with that. Unless it's instantaneous teleportation, it's going to take Kuma a while to circumnavigate the globe if he is heading to uh, Egghead right now, which I assume he would be. So they sacrifice their ship to get on the island, and then that's when Shaka begins to like activate the evacuation orders. He's like, okay, evacuate all the scientists and all the workers, get built the janitor out of here. We gotta make sure Bill the janitor survives. Atlas, come back to the main lab. We're activating S Snake, S Shark, and S Hawk to fight against the uh, intruders. We're gonna put them in charge. Uh, we're gonna put Sentomaru in charge of them. Okay. So, a couple of things here. So, he's activating three of the Seraphim to go on the offensive against the Cypher Pole, all right? And he's giving them in charge, he's giving Sentomaru the charge of them, okay? Sentomaru, we don't actually see in this chapter, but we see like an image of him. Sentomaru is the big sumo wrestling guy uh, with the giant axe that shows up and was like one of the first users of hockey to really like mess up Luffy. Like he was using the, uh, the invisible hockey to like, BAM! I mean like the sumo attack that was knocking Luffy down. Um, he became, he was originally just a member of the, the science group, you know, and then over the time scale, he becomes an actual official marine, but you could tell that Vegapunk actually does trust Sentomaru quite a bit because uh, Sentomaru is basically his lab assistant. So he's like, okay, we can trust Sentomaru. We'll put him in charge of S Snake, S Hawk, and S Shark. Uh, S Hawk. All right, who's S Hawk? S Snake is obviously Boa, so that was correct there. S uh, Shark, we've already met, is obviously Jinbei. S Hawk. S Hawk. Okay, which of the warlords? are based off of a hawk. I think Oda might have messed up on this one. I can't think of any... None of the warlords are based off of birds. Wait, no. Oh, okay. This must be S. Flamingo. Sorry, sorry, sorry. He must have messed it up. I know hawks and flamingos, very easy to mix them up. I do it all the time. Um, so yeah, the S version of Do Flamingo is being activated. It meant Mingo, not, you know, Hawk, because hawks are just not based off of anything. Okay, so yeah, it's obviously Seraphim Mihawk. Seraphim Mihawk, which I'm still thinking it should have been Seraphim Dracula. That would have been cooler. Release Esh Dracula. You know, it's like, blah, you know, it's like, I want to stab you with my sword. You know, like, that would be really cool. But no, S Hawk, Dracula Mihawk, you get it? Okay, cool. So we cut back to the town where we have the giant hologram alien snake creature and Kaku's actually really excited. Kaku's just like, I've always wanted to take a swing at an unworldly eldritch beast like this. So like a giant alien snake is coming at him. And Kaku's like, all right, here we go, Ronkyaku, and he uses Tempest Kick. Remember, um, out of the six powers, Ronkyaku Tempest Kick is like Kaku's specialty. That's how he developed his four, sto uh, four sword style technique, okay? With the two swords in his hands, and then using Ronkyaku with both of his feet. Okay, so he has the four sword style, so he uses a Tempest Kick. However, Stussy just says, don't bother, it's just a hologram, so the Tempest Kick just just travels right through the hologram. It doesn't really do anything. It actually seems like it bends the light a bit, but that's it. You know, so Stussy seems to know a little bit about the island to the point where Lucci even said that, like, you know, this information would have helped a lot earlier. You know, we were on the ship for several days. You could have explained to us what we were in for, but apparently Stussy did nothing, which makes me wonder, is Stussy working? Maybe she's triple crossing everybody or quadruple crossing everyone. I don't know, because it's a little weird that she knew so much information about the egghead. She's like, there's going to be holograms here. And uh, what else does she say? 
she says stuff about, oh yeah, the security. So, because the CP0 can fly, they have Gepo, they have Moonstep, they have the, the Skywalk that, you know, Asanji uses. Um, they look up at the sky, and they see the cloud, and they see the lab, and Kaku's just like, alright, well, Gepo, boing, boing, and there's like, you know, just stepping up, and then Stussy is like, ah, yes, however, if you cross a line up there, you'll activate the island's security defense mechanism, and you'll be pelted with laser fire. And then Kaku's like, wait, what's that? <laughs> <laughs> he just gets shot by a bunch of lasers in the sky. He's like, wait, what's that about lasers? Beep, 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 beep. Intruder alert. Wait, what? <laughs> he just gets shot with lasers and gets knocked back to the ground. He gets up, he's charred. He's like, goes up to Stussy and just like, you could have told me that sooner. You know, it's just like, so, um, this makes me wonder, like, is she on their side? Because she's not, she didn't tell any of them any of this until it was too late. So, I don't know. We don't know that much about Stussy and what her real goals are, so pay attention to her, I guess. Okay. But anyway, yeah. She explains that it's called the Frontier Dome. The Frontier Dome is, like, if you can't, you can't just access the lab by just flying up, so you'll just get immediately pelted with lasers, okay? Uh, you'll get, like, electroshocked or whatever. You have to be, like, accepted to enter the labosphere using the approved means. They have to allow you up there. So it's it's certainly not going to be easy to gain access to the lab, okay? They got to figure out another way to get around that, all right? Um, so Kaku is is fine. He's just like lightly charred now. Uh, at this point, Atlas shows up. So Atlas embodies Wrath. She's probably the physically most powerful member of the satellites. She's about the size of Kaido. She comes charging through the town and she's just like, who's causing all this ruckus here? I'm the only one allowed to cause havoc on Egghead. So she's about to like punch Luchi in the face. Shaka is on the intercom like, Atlas, do not fight him. You do not stand a chance. And Atlas is like, ultra mighty punch. And then at this point, because, you know, her design is based off of like Astro Boy kind of like style anime. And she's like, ultra special Atlas punch. And Luchi, she's using a technique like that against Luchi. Luchi just steps up, takes off his mask, turns into a leopard. And he's just like, this isn't a game. Roku Ogun! And then he just, boom! Six powers gun right in Atlas's face. And she's just like, wait, what? And like, half of her face gets cracked apart. Her eye gets completely destroyed. Now keep in mind, um, it also indicates here at this point, you know, Vegapunk said they were his clones, uh, but obviously some of them are robots. And in the case with Atlas, even though Atlas looked like a human, she's very clearly a robot because her face is cracking. Her eye is being cracked like it's glass and it's like shattering and stuff. Um, and so, yeah, Luchi used the six powers gun, which is once you master all of the six powers, you gain access to the seventh ability, which is the ultimate power gun. That you just like, you know, you know, attack your enemy with that. It's like a shockwave cannon that you use. He's used it um, against Luffy. There's another variant where he grabs an enemy with his tail so they can't move, and then he just uses, like, you know, a point-blank Roku Ogon, so no, but Atlas got it right in the face because she was just kind of an idiot and ran right into Rob Lucci. I mean, this is what happens when you do that. So, she gets attacked. This is the last scene of the chapter. Um, she gets dropped. All the other scientists are there, like, oh no, Dr. Atlas! You just see smoke just billowing out of her face. Although Lucci does say she's still breathing. So Lucci says that she's not dead yet. And I'm assuming that Vegapunk could probably heal her anyway. But it's not looking too good. So if you thought maybe the satellite bodies were going to be able... Because that's what I thought. I thought maybe the, the Straw Hats were going to team up with the satellite bodies and fight against the Cypher Pole. Um, Atlas was probably the physically strongest out of all of them. And we saw what happened there. Now still... You know, Rob Lucci is, like, a really strong character, though. Like, really powerful. And this was, like, his strongest move. So, the fact that Atlas wasn't able to survive it doesn't necessarily mean that none of the other satellites have a trick up their sleeve that they could use. Like, Lilith or Shaka could maybe do something. It just means that Atlas was kind of an idiot and went up against an... Like, like even Shaka gave her the order, like, come back. And she's like, no. I'm just gonna charge in and try to just straight punch... Uh, Rob Lucci, see what happens. 
So at this point, though, we have the final scene of the chapter. Luffy has Bonnie over his shoulder. They're running through the town as, like, explosions are happening in the distance. And then uh, he's like, let's head to the top with that vacuum rocket thing. What is the vacuum rocket thing? Is that something they've encountered already, or was that something that he just saw in the distance, and he's like, let's go to the top with that? I don't know. Also, does that imply that Luffy knows what a vacuum is? Like, either a vacuum cleaner or a vacuum, like, a vacuum in space. Vacuum rocket thing. I'm trying to think. Was that something they've already seen? I'm trying to think. Did they, did they encounter anything so far where it's like a rocket? They might have? I don't know. But anyway, yeah, they're like, let's head to the top. Let's, like, commandeer a rocket ship and go to the top. Anyway, because also, it's important to mention that in the One Piece world, um, there is science fiction. Like, the actual medium of science fiction exists. Like, the comic books. Like, Sora, you know, Night of the Sea. So, comic book technology exists. So, they might have knowledge of it from that perspective. And this was something Bonnie brought up, like, five chapters ago that I forgot to mention. But, like, so they might not actually have ever encountered rocket ships or robots. Uh, or at least, you know, not like these kind of robots. But they at least probably still know about them because, like, reading comic books, right? It's just like, oh, space travel and the rocket ship goes to space. You know, they might know about it from that perspective, okay? From, like, science fiction terms. Anyway, Luffy and Jinbei are running through the town, and they pass right by where Atlas was dropped by Luchi. And Luchi looks over and sees Luffy. And then their eyes meet. And he's just like, straw hat. And Luffy's running with Bonnie and just like, wait a second, you're the pigeon guy! And then, end of chapter. Oh, no break next week. Nice. Okay, so that was an intense one. This is where things really start getting moving. Uh, like I said, I don't think Egghead's going to be that long of an arc. So we had a little bit of exposition there, but not a lot of it. We had like two chapters where we focused a lot on like uh, Ohara and, you know, a little bit on Dragon and a little bit about, uh, about uh, Vegapunk's past and everything like that. And the Iron Giant. We've learned a little bit there. But now we're getting right into the action. We're moving along with this, okay? Cypher Pool Zero is on the island. They're causing havoc. They're attacking. S Bear is also with them. I'm assuming S Bear is working alongside them. Maybe Vegapunk has like an override control or something. Also, they mentioned the reason they're returning S Bear is because he wasn't complying with orders. So maybe Rob Lucci's going to try to give S Bear an order like. S Bear, attack Luffy and Bonnie. And S Bear would be like, tsk, tsk, error 44, please reboot. I'm like, okay, don't, everybody calm down. We gotta reboot the, the robot. And Luffy's like, okay, just. Tsk, tsk, so, Luffy, how you been? I'm like, I've been pretty good, you know? I've been training, you know, a lot. I'm getting stronger. You still have the pigeon? Yeah, we still have the pigeon. We've gotten stronger too, you know? I, oh, hold on. No, it's in safe mode. Hold on. Yeah, anyway, uh, I joined Cypher Pool Zero. I got the cool outfit and everything. I got the top hat. That's really neat. It was like, yeah, cool. All right, cool. Great. Neat. I could go in gear fifth now. Oh, really? Gear fifth? You only had gear third when you fought me. That was crazy. All right, we're good. All right, let's fight. <laughs> that would have been, been funny. Anyway, okay, so... um. Are we just gonna have a reunion, like, fight next chapter? Like, a rematch? Like, you know, Monkey D. Luffy versus Rob Lucci. The rematch of the millennium. I'll be honest with you. Luffy's fight with Lucci, um, and the fact that their names are so similar is awesome. I'm glad that they're back here now. But, um, it's one of the best fights in all of One Piece. Like, it really is. The finale of that fight of Luffy going gear second, Jet Gatling, and just y letting out that yell, that that visceral, just primal scream therapy yell as he's just fighting through the pain and just slamming Luchi into a wall. You know, you know that is just one of the best scenes in One Piece. Like, it really is. And I think a lot of people, if they're gonna make like a top 10 best fights in, or like Luffy's best fights in One Piece, Luchi's gonna be, like not even, okay, if you're just talking about Luffy's fights, Luffy versus Luchi's gotta be top five for most people, if not their favorite fight, okay? So this, this is a good scene. And I also really liked it, like it, that Oda does not like immediately kill off all of the enemies. And, or just have them turn good, or have them go start a bakery. You know, it's like Luffy did not kill Luchi at Eni's lobby. So, he got back up, he trained, he got stronger, and now they're encountering each other again. 
You know what I mean? Like, that's what happens, okay? Luffy did, Luchi did not turn good. Luchi did not retire. Luchi's still working for the government. And there might be his own goals and ambitions and things, but there's nothing stopping him from, like, running into Luffy again. It's like, okay, we're gonna fight again. You didn't finish me off the first time, so here we go. I might actually win this time. Luchi's a lot stronger now, okay? Um, I do want to see the other Straw Hats fight him, just to see how strong they've gotten as well. But we might have a brief interaction here. Next chapter might be, like, Luffy versus Luchi, and, like, the fight starts, and they're kind of, like, you know, rumbling, and then Luffy jumps away or something. They get on a rocket ship, and they fly up to the Labosphere or something, and then Luchi is just, like, cracking his knuckles, like... Next time, you can't get away, Straw Hat. Might be something like that, maybe. So, we'll see. Also, I'm curious of whether or not Luchi has a grudge against Luffy. You know, if he's just like, you know, you defeated me last time. I took that personally. You know, I, I don't know if he does because he's more about just like bloodthirsty assassinations. I don't know if he would hold a grudge on that level. And it certainly doesn't seem like it because every other time we've seen Luchi so far post time skip, he doesn't, he's not sitting around like, I'm going to eliminate Luffy if it if, if it takes every hair off of my body, you know? Nothing like that. It's It just seems like he's a professional assassin. This is what he does. He's like, oh, Straw Hat's here. Oh, Pigeon Guy's here. All right, well, guess we got to fight. So no break next week. And also, he's carrying Bonnie. So Luffy might also, like, hand Bonnie off to Jinbei or Chopper and be like, you guys get to the lab. I'll take care of this guy. Don't worry. I fought him before. All right? But he's obviously a lot faster, a lot stronger. He's got hockey now. If Luchi had Conqueror's hockey, that wouldn't be surprising in the slightest. So Luffy's got to be a little careful here. I would not say Luchi's at the same level as Kaido, um, but still a threat, okay? A lot faster than Kaido, if nothing else. So we're going to see where this goes, but a really good chapter, and we learned some stuff about Devil Fruits. We learned some stuff about, um, I guess, Vegapunk's ultimate dream, and he can teleport, apparently. Kuma's on his way there, I guess. Uh, also, Vegapunk Punk said, you know, take her to my lab, take Bonnie to my lab, because there's something I need to give her there. So we'll see what that is. Um, yeah, maybe it's the memory disc that has her dad's, like, you know, uh, morals and memories and, you know, personality and everything stored in it. Maybe it's something like that. Uh, I guess we'll wait to see. Anyway, thanks for watching, everybody. This will be Teching, signing out. Later. Oh, yeah, and then the Seraphim are going to fight. So Luffy might be fighting Luchi for the next chapter, and then the Seraphim jump in, and then that gives Luffy the opportunity to leave. Okay, and then Luchi's up against Seraphim Jinbei or something. Thing and we'll see where that goes. All right, wait a minute. Thanks for watching, everybody. Teching, signing out.